Two days ago, Apple announced the new Mac Mini Pro. We're going to be talking all about that today. Uh, the cost of entry, using it for distributed processing as a render farm, uh, if you are in motion graphics or video editing, or even if you're in the scientific community, all that and more, jump on in. Please uh, click subscribe on YouTube, follow us on Facebook and Twitter, and uh, check out our iTunes podcast. We just had an Apple event yesterday uh, where they announced a new Mac Mini, new MacBook Air, and a new iPad Pro. Now, a lot of people were disappointed because they didn't have what they expected, and a disappointment normally has to do with expectations. I prefer to not have any expectations at all to not get disappointed. Gabe, were you disappointed? No, I wasn't disappointed at all. Um, I wasn't anticipating a uh, Mac Mini. Uh, I've never owned one, and I just bought an iMac uh, this year after returning two iMac Pros, and it's been great. That said, it's really reassuring to see them update that line, and um, it seems to be a little bit more pro-level than an entry-level machine, which it might have been intended for at one point. Uh, the, the most interesting th thing to me are that it has four Thunderbolt 3 ports, as well as the option to upgrade to 10 gigabit Ethernet which until now I believe only the iMac Pro has. What jumped out yeah. to, to you? Well, uh, first of all, the Mac Mini was the best announcement for me for the, whole, uh, for the whole event. The Mac Mini has always been such a low barrier entry into the Apple world. Uh, at some point it was cheaper than it is today, but it, it, it is really a computer that in my mind is meant to be in a server as part of a cluster or uh, to become a cheap way to get some type of tasks done. And, and the way I see it as a server is because the form factor of it makes it possible for you to stack so many of them together. Mm -hmm. uh, only the Pro machines from Apple have four Thunderbolt ports. Only the Pro machines from Apple have 10 gigabit Ethernet. So. I think that indeed this Mac Mini is a pro level machine. I don't think they, I think they just didn't put the pro name there because you know how people would be like, oh, how can you call this Mac Mini Pro if you don't, you have only like integrated graphics and whatever. And it doesn't really matter with four Thunderbolts. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter which internal graphics you really have because if you need to transcode uh, 8K Red Raw, you're gonna put external GPUs there, and you can put up to four external GPUs very easily. Yep. Uh, each one with its own bus, so it, it, it's really an interesting machine for me. And it has, it has opened so many doors in what we can do with it that I'm super excited. I'm really considering getting one. Really? So, the biggest drawback, uh, the, the thing I like or dislike most about my 5K iMac. Um, and it's a wonderful machine. It's just that there there are only two Thunderbolt three ports, so I've got a nest of cables in the back, daisy chained. Whereas if I had four, and I missed the four when I had the iMac Pro, and this has four again. And it sounds like such a little thing, but the ability to directly connect versus daisy chaining um, for me is is a really big thing. So I'm curious about that. And you you talked about clustering Mac Minis together, say for example for a render farm, and if you guys out there don't know what a render farm is, it would be like, you know, say you've got some pretty intensive 3D animation or visual effects that you need to get out of your system. If you stack processors and graphics cards, they can all process that together. So, you know, one thing I might do if I was doing a complex animation is I could send that file to another company that just does a render farm. So maybe some company in India has a room full of these types of machines that can just plow through that send me back the rendered video and done deal. Now with the Mac Mini, you've, you've always been able to do this, but now you can you can kind of do it anew with the updated cards and everything. But just like you said, stack them up, render things out quicker. But does that, does that, does that work with pro apps? Uh, it does with Compressor. Compressor has an option to, to make a distributed uh, render. So for example, you can add 
let's say that uh, you need to just uh, to create four different flavors of of an export. So we export out of Final Cut in whatever ProRes it is. You throw it in Compressor, and Compressor is able to use all the computers that are available on that cluster to uh, to render that. It is kind of kind of complicated to 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 set it up and to get it really working, but it does work. It doesn't work with every codec either. Um, but yeah, it, it, it can work. Well, and what if you are, say, like a DaVinci or Premiere user? Are you, can they take advantage of that? I actually don't know. Uh, Premiere, I would probably guess not. Premiere doesn't even properly support a bunch of other things that are just supposed to be native in one computer itself. I think uh, putting a lot of computers together may be media encoder, but I, I don't know what I'm talking about. Uh, I think media encoder probably has an option like that, but I never heard of anyone ever mentioning about a distributed uh, transcode or encode or anything like that. Okay. Uh, now, DaVinci, it's very interesting because DaVinci takes advantage of however many GPUs you have uh, attached to the computer. Okay. So you could be running Linux or Mac OS or Windows on that Mac Mini and having four GP eGPUs connected to it, and DaVinci will take all of them. We use all of them. So suddenly you have a super powerful computer. If you get a, um, let's give an example, a Mac Mini that's going to cost you $800 plus four eGPUs, um, the RX 580 that Blackmagic does, then you have about, what, $3,000 on a computer with four GPUs. Uh, it's not too bad. And now they also came out with uh, the eGPU Pro, right? With the uh, with the 56, with the RX 56, the the entry level card that is on the iMac Pro. So it's really not too bad. Well, let's talk about the cost to benefit ratio. So if you can get the base level uh, Mac Mini and four of those uh, non-Pro Blackmagic eGPUs, and you said that was about three grand. Of course, you don't get a monitor, you don't get a keyboard, you don't get a trackpad or mouse. If somebody wanted to go another route and achieve similar power, is that going to cost them more or less? I'm talking within the Apple ecosystem, and I'm not talking build your own. Uh, within the Apple ecosystem, you could... Well, question number one is, do you need four eGPUs? If the answer is no, then you should definitely consider other routes as well. Uh, I think Apple is really good at putting, let's say, five different uh, devices that you can buy and each one overlaps on the previous one. Sure. So there is an area in which the Mac Mini will overlap with the MacBook Pro, the MacBook Pro will overlap with the iMac, the iMac will overlap with the iMac Pro. Um, and, and, and it's up to you to find in which area it is that you are. If you are in the area that does not overlap with any device, then it's an easy decision, right? If it's overlapping with another one, then you start losing hair because like, oh, should I go for the Mac Mini or the MacBook Pro? Should I go for, because the MacBook Pro also has four Thunderbolts. Yeah. Plus has the advantage that has the monitor and is portable well, and it has battery. So what kind of work would one be doing generally if they require four eGPUs? Uh, on set DIT, for example, um, that would be a very good example. Can you describe for the audience what a DIT is? So the DIT is the digital imaging technician. Uh, that's the person that is, in a very simplistic way, is getting the cards from the cameras and importing them, maybe uh, doing the transcode for uh, whatever flavors that we need, proxies and etc. Organizing that footage while everything is being done on set. So they're they're handling all the technicals and artistic stuff because they'll also do things like supply lots. They might apply lots, lots to monitors yeah. so that the director and and crew can see a, a version of the final image. Exactly, and for things like uh, Firefly, which is one of the color grading on set color grading. Uh, plugins that they are using, for example, together with Airy cameras, they connect everything and they see the LUT uh, live on cameras and they are able to adjust things live. Uh, I think having several Mac Minis or Mac Minis with several eGPUs there uh, will be very good, mainly because you can put that Mac Mini on a cart. Uh, you put a cart with a monitor and a bunch of eGPUs arrayed connected to that. Um, we've been talking about a little bit of video and using Mac Mini, but there is the other side, which is using the Mac Mini as a server, for example. 
And for me, that is the part that that I find very interesting because, like you were saying before, we've been talking about NAS and shared storage and things like that. And the Mac Mini, right there, I'm going to give you one example. Mac Mini, a lacy 24 terabyte RAID or a Pegasus or whatever that's over Thunderbolt. So you're using one Thunderbolt. Um, you have a 10 gig out, okay? And you still have another three Thunderbolt. On the other three Thunderbolt or out of, uh, uh, or out of the RAID, you can connect a Thunderbolt to 10 gig adapter. So you, uh, a Mac Mini could potentially be serving four or five independent 10 gigabit clients. So the only thing that you're gonna really need there is make sure to have a, a powerful processor, um, enough RAM, and and this Mac Mini is a powerful server right there. Okay, well, and you have a very fast storage. Compare that to so we've been talking about the Synology, which is a very popular, expensive, and robust. Well, the the unit isn't that expensive, all things considered. But you have to pop. I mean, you have to pop the, the example that I just said. Oh well, yeah. So would be expensive. For example, if I wanted to go the Synology route. And now I'm considering a Mac Mini mount, uh, route. What does a Synology or, and there's nothing special about Synology per se, I just mean proper network attached storage. How does that differ from the Mac Mini route? What can and you, can you not do? Well, the Mac Mini is definitely very flexible in a lot of ways. Uh, the Synology, the, the, the very interesting thing is because it's a one package that is made for that purpose, made for shared storage. Uh, you don't have a lot of cables hanging off of it, so you have only power and network that goes into it. It goes either to a switch or directly to the computer. Uh, the Mac Mini, you can put anything inside, really. You're not going to be changing things. Everything is soldered, probably, so even the memory you have to decide as soon as you're buying the computer. Memory is uh, memory is upgradable, user. Is it upgradable? It is, yeah. Okay, you've got to so... remove the fan, I think, first. But Oh, yeah, they said that's a sodium uh, slot, right? Yeah. Uh, so at least that we can we can update, but storage the internal storage is soldered. You're not going to be able to do that. Um, but the Mac Mini has that advantage. For example, you have a, a three uh, OWC raids. Some people they're going to have uh, a Thunderbolt three Pegasus drives and, and and things like that. So you could potentially. Connect those raids to the so something that you already have. You're not in, uh, spending any more money. You connect to the Mac Mini, and you connect to the Mac Mini through the 10 gigabit port, and then that that Mac Mini is actually serving that raid on the network and giving access over 10 gigabit. Um, of course, there's a lot of settings to play with it there to make sure that performance is going to be high. But uh, it, there is a likelihood that you can get very good performance out of it better than a dedicated nas because you can get more ram you can get more ram in the mac mini than you can in most network attached storage uh, see, see, see it this way um mac os has some problems to share files over the network just because of the implementation of nfs and smb they, that it has it has several quirks but you can use bootcamp to install a Linux distribution uh, on Mac Mini, okay? So suddenly you have this super powerful computer that's very small and is running a version of, of Linux. Uh, one example is the FreeNAS. FreeNAS is one, uh, one distribution that it's an OS that's made for raids. Normally you're gonna be reading internal drives, but I, I'm fairly certain that you can use external uh, directly attached uh, storage to serve over the network. Okay. So then you wouldn't really have a graphics user interface that is very advanced like macOS or Windows running. And all of that resource, all of that CPU, all of those RAM would be completely dedicated to serving storage. And I think that's one of the ways that you could get a uh, very high performing uh, shared storage using a Mac mini. And again, maybe this is considering uh, for those that already have raids uh, sitting on their desks and they're seeing that they need to share uh, with other people because their offices are growing or something like that. So the Mac Mini can become this little hub with a very low expenditure that can start at, what, $800, mm -hmm. right? The Synology, uh, I think uh, it's, it's that gray area that we were talking about. 
because you can, for a very low price, have a lot more storage, raw storage available. Um, but performance-wise in the network for many people accessing at the same time might not be great. Uh, for things like that, you want a jellyfish, for example, because those guys, they put the jellyfish has Xeon processors with a bunch of RAM. They have um, SSD cache. So all of those things help the unit be fast and performing really well. But the, the Jellyfish has a pretty high cost of entry, though. It depends on how you see it, though. Well, I, I, um, I don't mean... If it's raw storage, yes. I don't mean high compared to... I don't mean that compared to other products, it's expensive at all. I just mean it's like a one-man shop like me... That, that, that's yes. a big leap to the, to the first jellyfish. Yes, yes, mainly because when you're a, a, a shop with one or two people, it's more important for you to have raw storage than for you to have performance. Because performance, you can buy a T1 Samsung SSD and most of the projects you're going to be able to fit within one or two terabytes. So you, you can get performance out of a, a little SSD, right? Or even... If you want to have a faster SSD, you can get a, uh, an Angel Bird, and you're gonna get two gigabytes a second out of that SSD. Okay. Um, but yeah, it's just about finding uh, that sweet spot. Uh, so, for example, uh, in your case, I think that Mac Mini is is the moment that you think: one, do I want? How much do I want to spend right now to make it possible to have shared storage? Two. What do I do with my OWC drives um, or with my existing RAID? So that's, those are the questions that I see Mac Mini get into the scene on, on, on the idea of being a server. Okay. And, and, well, let's say that you get a Mac Mini and it becomes your server, okay? You use your OWC drives and you start sharing uh, in your network. And then at some point you say, okay, I'm ready for something bigger. I need more storage, maybe. And then you go for a NAS. And then you're like, well, but now I have this Mac Mini. Yeah, but now the Mac Mini became a third computer that you can actually add it from because it's that powerful. And if it's not powerful enough, you add an eGPU and you go on. Okay. So I think, I think Mac Mini is a, an investment that will not lose value anytime soon, I would say. And that's talking about using it as a server. Now, what if somebody wanted to just use it for edit, Even editing? Even as an edit station. You know, we add your other monitor onto it. it, and... it look, eventually, eventually, Final Cut Pro 10 will support multiple GPUs. Yeah. Eventually. They have to. Um, I, I would I would fathom, so, I guess, as soon as next month or maybe December. So that pretty much future proves the Mac Mini. Just right there, it future proofs if, because if you're a Final Cut, if you use Final Cut 10, if you use Final Cut Pro 10, because the performance of Final Cut Pro 10 on playback on the timeline where you're spending most of your time comes from the GPU. Yeah. So it uses the GPU to render the timeline to playback everything. So if you have an external GPU, one powerful, it's gonna play back fine. Any GPU that's out there right now will make you be able to edit 4K easy on a Mac Mini. In the future, if you have bigger, uh, if you're editing Red Draw 8K, well, just add another eGPU. So it's, it, it, that for me is what modular even means. Not necessarily that modular internally, but modular externally. Well, I And you can daisy chain stuff, yeah? We're, we're cutting multicam 4K on a late 2013 iMac. Um, so I wouldn't be concerned that even the base model, well, okay, let's let's talk through this. So I was I was about to say even the base model uh, Mac Mini should be able to chug through that, but the base model is only an i3, whereas this iMac, even though it's five years old, is an i7. How big of a difference is that? Because really, like you said, we're dealing with the graphics card here, not so much the CPU. So would a base would a base model proficiently handle editing and playback of multicam 4K? So yeah, um, base model. 3.6 gigahertz i3. Oh, it, it it will be fine. It's just the RAM, the 8 gigabytes. But if you're saying that is replaceable, I would buy the base model 
i3 is 3.6 gigahertz. Um, and of course, we can wait for everyone to start doing benchmarks on the internet. Sure. Yeah, everyone's going to end up doing that, right? Um, but in my head here, I get the 3.6 gigahertz i3 with 8 gigabytes of RAM. We know that Apple RAM is super expensive, so I get go there and change for some 16 or 32 gigabytes. You can go up to 64 now. Yes, and and the base model has 128 gigabytes of, of internal SSD. I find that very small. Yeah, oh yeah. <laughs> very small. Uh, so that that's the part that worries me about the, the, the base model. But if you're running as a server, that's enough. If you're running Final Cut and you're using an external storage, that's that's enough. If you're gonna use a, a day-to-day uh, machine that you're gonna be putting your photos there and and your iCloud stuff and etc. Yeah, maybe 128 gigabytes internal is not very good. Uh, but if it will become an edit station or a server, I think that's definitely enough. Yeah, the thought occurred to me uh, watching the announcement yesterday that if you were using it as your your actual workstation. You're, you're attaching a, an external display and that's your machine. If you were to download all the sounds that come with Logic Pro 10, I think they take up 80 plus gigabytes just by itself. Luckily enough, the latest update of Logic, you can put it on uh, you're external? able to actually, yes, you can. Okay, that's good to know. So that, 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 that's big, which is great. Uh, and, and maybe can be even uh, a little roadmap of where things, to, what things uh, Final Cut may end up doing as well. Mm-hmm. Because right now we can only put motion templates on the movies folder of the user that's using, right? And well, so, after that, they yeah, they implemented yes. putting it in, into the library. Yeah. If you put it into a shared storage and everyone is pointing at that one location, whoa, that's so much easier to, to manage a hundred editors that have to have access to the same animations. Yeah. So, and and for example, if we're if your uh, editors that are remote, for example, you and me, and we are collaborating, and we have our get a grip animations and things like that, you could put on your external thing there. I put on my external thing here, and we put them to sync between themselves. So whatever new thing you add there, it adds here, and you don't need to do anything. So. That, that, for me, it's a little bit of a roadmap of where Final Cut can go. Of course, the priority on that on their list probably is not very high, but yeah. eventually can appear there. Who knows? Well, I, I think they're, they're going to be forced, I think, to work on collaboration if they're not already. And I'm sure they have. You know, It just might take them years until they get it the way they want it. And that type of shared storage is obviously a, a, a big step in that process. Uh, I'm pretty sure that they are setting up the Mac Mini to be... Uh, a, a very flexible computer for whatever they have in mind. Why would why would they bother allowing for the ten G upgrade if it wasn't meant for networking? Exactly. I mean, there, <laughs> there is only one reason why you would have a ten gigabit Ethernet on a computer, and that's to access storage. Uh, there is nothing else. Your internet, you're not gonna have ten gigabits no. connection no. to the internet, yeah. not anytime soon. No. Uh, not even Apple that puts uh, ports early on, they are not putting that for your internet connection. Uh, so it's definitely for shared storage, and shared storage means collaboration. So yeah. it's in the air. They put it in the iMac Pro, they put it in the Mac Mini. The next step will be having uh, the iMacs coming with 10 gigabit as well. So I, I would guess that the 2019 iMac uh, will come with a 10 gigabit as well. The same way that they did with Thunderbolt and USB-C across the border. Uh, they they made the new iPad Pro USB-C as well, which is another huge step forward. Um, I mean, I, I don't see an event like the one from yesterday as, as uh, the state of Apple and technology today. I see of the state of where we're going. Yeah. And that's what gets me excited. Well, and it's interesting that it was because I forgot the actual tagline, but wasn't it? It was kind of billed as this creative event or an event for creatives, right? It wasn't. It, it was. It yeah. wasn't just like a product announcement. And the fact that these are the specific products they chose to announce at that event is kind of telling. It was in New York on the Music Academy of New York or something like that, or of Brooklyn or something like this. 
Uh, and from the very beginning, when they sent the invitations that each Apple logo was a different artwork, uh, and in the very beginning of the event, they were just uh, animating through every artwork that they created for the Apple logo. I mean, immediately right there, you're saying, this is an event for creatives. Mm -hmm. Now, do you call creatives professionals? Do you call professionals creatives? That's semantics for me. Yeah, uh, agreed. In the end of the day, they, they even the MacBook Air, man. Uh, the MacBook Air is a is a computer that if you are cutting on Final Cut Pro 10, you're gonna be able to cut a 4K there. Oh yeah, easily. Uh, people are gonna say you can't cut 4K on the MacBook Air. Yes, if you're using Premiere, because Premiere, I'm sorry, it's just not up to the job of using the hardware that's available. No, the um, Adobe apps scream for you to throw as much power at them as possible, which is why, uh, and obviously. Apple has the benefit of making the hardware and the software. That's why they can optimize Final Cut 10. But Adobe has a lot of resources as well. And they just, you know, try running Adobe on a three-year-old machine or a six-year-old machine. It's hmm. going to be struggling. Mm -hmm. and whereas I've edited Final Cut 10 on even a late 2009. Uh, and up until last year, it was still doing a pretty decent job. I think, I mean, th these are all the thoughts that I have about this event and the new Mac Mini. Mac Mini is really extremely exciting for me. Uh, and... I just can't wait to get my hands on one. You can see here in my shot, I have uh, two Synology units uh, running here on my desk. They are not very loud. and But just the fact that I can think of getting the Mac Mini and having a way more powerful computer serving storage. And, and again, I said before, in case you have RAIDs, right, that you connect over Thunderbolt. Yeah. What about my Synology? Well... I can still connect it to the Mac Mini. This analogy will still be in the network, so I'm still gonna use it. How do you can? Uh, how would so you I'm connect? I'm not losing anything. USB. Well, no, I wouldn't connect this analogy to the Mac Mini. This analogy is already on the network, so if I need to mount it, I mount it on my iMac, uh, and there will be storage that will be coming from the Mac Mini. There will be storage that will come from uh, from this analogy. If I need to to add it out of a shared storage. I can actually buy a RAID, a normal RAID, uh, connect to the Mac Mini, serve it on the network, and I can say, Mac Mini, uh, sync your RAID to the Synology storage, that's the slower one, and keep that as a backup. I mean, there are so many options. Uh, and for what, 800, let's say, let's call it 1,000. For $1,000, for $1,000 being able to to do this for me, I, I think it's worth. It's it's not too bad. It's the same thing as the Blackmagic Pocket Cinema Camera 4K. Yeah, it's not a super expensive camera, and to be a B camera, uh, it's not bad. No, it's really good for a B camera. Again, it, it, even for shooting, it depends on what you're doing. If you're shooting a, a million dollar television commercial, maybe it's not the B camera you want. But mm. for a lot of budgets less than that, it might be a fantastic A cam. Oh yeah. So. Yeah, I'm excited. I'm excited about the, the Mac Pro. Um, I'm not in the market for one. I'm perfectly happy with my 5K iMac, which also says a lot about the performance of even just their standard iMacs. Um, it's outperforming the, the Mac Pro, iMac Pro that I had. Uh, which is, and it's a consumer. Which is one, one, one other point I made. I was talking to Thomas, who's been on our show uh, three times already. Um, he was getting excited about this and this Vega 64 GPU. And I said, well, be careful because I had the Vega 64 on my iMac Pros and my performance was much worse than my 5K iMac. And he reminded me that the bottleneck there was the CPU that's on the iMac Pro, which is different on the Mac Pro. So the Mac Pro, I'm sorry, the Mac Mini, Mac Mini will support QuickSync, which was missing from the iMac yes. Pro. And QuickSync is huge for most people in the type of media we edit. So I'm glad he, yeah. he pointed that out because that suddenly makes... But only on the i7, because I think they only put QuickSync on the i7 now. Yeah, so you would have to get the upgraded version. I, I wouldn't really recommend doing any serious editing with less than an i7 personally. But uh, I also wouldn't recommend less than, say, 32 gigabytes of RAM if you can afford it. But anyway, him pointing that out reminded me, and I, and I forgot we had that conversation until now, that makes the Mac Mini a little bit more appealing for me because if I had to replace my wife's computer, which is the late 2013, I might just get her the Mac Mini and use her computer as the external display. And I could do it for a thousand bucks or 1200 maybe. Which we can't do with the 5K computers anymore, but if you have an older iMac, you can do that, yes. target display mode. Yep. And I would, I mean, 
if I needed an extra computer right now for editing, it would be a Mac Mini. No questions. It would be a Mac Mini. Yeah, if I wasn't ready to buy, uh, waiting for a Mac Pro, there's no way I'm going to buy the current Mac Pro. I'm not going down the iMac Pro route again anytime soon. So yeah, the Mac Mini for me would be like the number one choice I think right now. Yeah, you you get you get a Mac Mini with an external GPU. Suddenly you have a computer that has four Thunderbolts, two USBs. Um, you have Quick Sync, and you have that powerful GPU. <laughs> it's not a bad it's not a bad setup at all. And you can buy the the space space gray keyboard and mouse with the space gray Mac Mini, and it's a sweet looking setup as well. I do miss that about that Mac Pro. It was really sexy. The keyboard and the trackpad, it was nice, but it's not worth an extra $8,000 for that color, so. Cool, uh, I guess that's all that we have to say about Mac Mini Apple for today, I guess then. Yeah, you guys, I hope have opinions on this and we'd love to hear about it. It would kind of be disheartening if our one episode dedicated to a piece of hardware gets the most comments because it's not, it doesn't go nearly as deep as any other episode we've done, but we'd love to hear from you nonetheless. Okay, see ya. Bye.